Hey guys, so about a year ago, I posted news on my Instagram that the beloved genus of Sansevieria, commonly known as snake plants or mother-in-law's tongue, got moved over or subsumed into this Dracaena genus. Now, all I could say is that it caused quite an uproar of sorts. And I promised folks that I would do a video on this reclassification of Sansevieria to Dracaena, but it took me a while to track down the main researcher. Then we had so many other videos in the lineup. And then I decided to do 365 days of plants. Then I had that book tour for how to make a plant love you. And well, <laughs> I just couldn't find the time to do this video justice until now. So let me paint a high level overview here because Sansevieria and Dracaena and another group called Pleomeli and that latter one, we're not gonna be really concentrating on too much. But all of these have been disputed in taxonomic circles really since the 18th century. Now, some taxonomists argued that the floral structures of Sansevieria looked similar enough to Dracaena to warrant them in the same category. But others disagreed or completely disregarded the floral structures altogether because these plants are rarely in bloom and therefore they're not really scrutinized based on their floral structures. Plus, if you're just looking at Dracaena and the genus formerly known as Sansevieria, the rest of their morphological characteristics look really different from one another. So Dracaena, like this Dracaena Janet Craig I have here, these are usually thinner leaved and have woody stems. And then you have snake plants, which I have this uh, Kirkii right here. I don't think it's called Sansevieria Kirkii or Pulper anymore, but um, this has like these really thick succulent leaves and often they spread rhizomatously, which is like a stem that is just below ground or above ground and they kind of spread that way. So again, from a morphological perspective, they look really different. But this again points to these traditional methods of plant classification because we didn't have genetics back in the day. We only had plant floral structures. So that's one of the ways that we tell whether plants are in the same genus is by looking at their reproductive parts, which is flowers and inflorescences. Now, there are other morphological features that could come into play as well, like looking at the differences of the epidermal structures underneath a microscope. So the epidermis is just the outside of the leaf. And that is usually good in distinguishing species from another species within the same genus. But it's really the floral structures that are used to classify plants. But since like the 1990s, there has been this big emphasis on DNA sequencing of plants. And as you can imagine, over the last 30 years, that DNA sequencing has improved dramatically. So analyzing a plant's genes allows us to go beyond just that floral morphology or the epidermal analysis in order to group plants accordingly on this like molecular level. So in plant cells, if we look at where the DNA is, it's in three sets. It's in the nucleus, it's in the chloroplast, and in the mitochondria. And all three of these can be used. And the more you use, obviously, the more accurate the results. So when you combine this DNA or molecular analysis with a closer examination of floral structures, then you start to get more of an accurate picture of where these plants should be classified within the plant kingdom and how they relate to one another. Now, there may be more up-to-date numbers, but chloroplast genomes can have around like 120 to about 130 genes. And most of these, as you can imagine, participate in photosynthesis and other things like transcription and translation. And chloroplast genomes in particular are more, I would say, quote unquote, stable. So they have these low rates of mutations, especially compared to the nuclear genome. So there's this one study I found that said that the chloroplast genome evolves an average 10 times slower than the nuclear genome. So I would imagine that sampling the genes of the chloroplast in particular 
is a sure way to get better results and more accurate results when resolving these like evolutionary relationships among plants and seeing where they sit, phylogenetically speaking. Additionally, there is this use of a technique called DNA barcoding, which basically is using these short snippets of a plant's DNA as an identifier for that plant. So you can use these regions to begin analyzing that across these species of interest. Now the reason why I bring up all this molecular stuff is to really help you understand that it's the chloroplast genome that taxonomists are actually using to determine Sansevieria's reclassification to Dracaena. So one of the watershed studies that was conducted that really convinced most taxonomists that Sansevieria is nested into Dracaena now was this one, and it's a mouthful. It's phylogenetic relationships among Dracaenoid genera inferred from chloroplast DNA loci. And loci simply is just this position of a gene. Now this peer-reviewed science paper really stemmed from one graduate dissertation by a young woman named Pei Luen Lu, and that was completed two years prior to the peer-reviewed paper releasing. So that was in 2012. So basically, this is like really old news. But this was a fairly comprehensive study, and they looked at 95 species, which is a lot, because there is believed to be between 80 and 120 Dracaena, more or less, and an additional 60 species of Sansevieria, which of course have been reclassified into Dracaena. So we're talking about less than 180 species. So 95 is more than half of the known species analyzed, and that is enough to help you paint this really good phylogenetic tree so you can see how each of these species actually relate to one another. Now, they looked at not just one chloroplast region, you know, when they're doing this DNA barcoding, but actually four combined chloroplast regions. Now, technically, you could study the entire chloroplast DNA using this, like, next generation sequencing, but as Pei Luen had said, I think the, the most, uh, the, the most uh, problem is that uh, if we want to get an entire chloroplast uh, genomics, uh, the sequence, and uh, for the 95 Justina species, it uh, needed a huge funding. <laughs> a huge amount of funding, okay. <laughs> so they sampled their DNA, and they, it, that came from all sorts of places. I mean, fresh specimens, which is actually the best place that you could get DNA, herbarium specimens, and the DNA bank at Royal Botanic Gardens Q. So the conclusion of all of this is that Dracaena is paraphyletic in regards to Sansevieria, and those species should be recognized as species of Dracaena. Now, paraphyletic simply means that you have the species and it's descended from a common evolutionary ancestor or ancestral group, but it doesn't include all the descendant groups. Now, what the genetic analysis also shows is the group, formerly known as Sansevieria, really radiated rapidly. So there is actually little genetic differentiation among the species, which I think snake plant lovers can empathize with because morphologically speaking, many of them look similar to one another. Dracaena, however, are much older from an evolutionary perspective, and Pei Luen shared this. If in India, you can find the 20 Dracaena species, and then you make the final genetic trees, and then you will find that the variation are so huge different within the, those 20 species in, the, in the India compared to the 80 species in the other countries. Hmm. I mean, so it's, we all say that the India is the biodiversity of the Jacina. I also asked her whether Sansevieria's morphological features may have prevented them from speciating more. And is that because Dracaena are more likely to flower and produce berries and then maybe with bird migration that's carried over? Like most of the Sansevieria that I know morphologically have rhizomes, which tells me that it's a safety net for them so that they could spread even though they're producing clones. So they're less likely to speciate out because they're just spreading clones of themselves 
versus putting out flowers and berries that could then be spread by birds. Would that be a potential hypothesis? I think so. Okay. So it's a very often on sexual reproduction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it would be cloning, cloning. So, I mean, uh, <clears throat> in the in the Earth in the Earth life, Jocelyn come out first, and uh, since we uh, come to Earth later. Now, on the topic of berries, I actually have one plant over here that had some berries on it from because it had flowers and it went to fruit. So uh, she said that the fruits of Dracaena and Sansevieria are pretty much identical. According to the flower morphology, they are the same group. A lot of specimen you don't see flowers, you only see fruits. Right. But the, but the Sansevieria and the Dracaena, the fruits, they are almost the same. So why is it Dracaena and not the other way around? Round? Like why is Dracaena not subsumed into Sansevieria? Well, the genus name Dracaena happened in 1767 and therefore has priority over Sansevieria, which was named or discovered in 1794, and Pleomeli was in 1796. So Dracaena must be used because it has this precedence, and that becomes the genus to name all the other species in the clade. And And because they're all kind of in the same genus or congeneric, which essentially means belonging to the same actually genus, then it all becomes Dracaena. So this actually supports an earlier classification scheme from 1998, arguing that Sansevieria should be nested in Dracaena. In addition to speaking with Pei Luen, I had a call with Dr. Isabel Laridan from the Royal Botanic Gardens Q and visiting professor at Ghent University, where she is working with one of her students on further genetic analysis of the genus formerly known as Sansevieria to resolve their phylogenetic relationships. But what we're doing is we're using a new sequencing technique, allowing us to sample a lot more of the data. So we're uh, doing whole um, chloroplast genomes Uh, And that means that we have a a lot more DNA data to do the analysis on. So that should give us more support in resolving relationships, which have been difficult within Sansevieria, because it's a fairly young group evolutionary. So if it's only a few million years old, you often get relationships that are very close together. A lot of the species are really closely related. They might hybridize, and it's, it's very difficult to then... Um, resolve uh, uh, an evolutionary tree. So that's what we're hoping to contribute is is having an evolutionary tree which is well resolved. Um, In terms of how it links with the Dracaena Sansevieria question, that's less of the topic of this paper because it's been shown in previous papers that Sansevieria is part of Dracaena. So for us that, that question is kind of resolved already. Like Pei Luen, Isabel's team sampled the chloroplast genome, but used a different kind of technique called genome skimming. So when we started this project um, three years ago, we had to make a decision on which technique shall we use. And genome skimming is a fairly simple um, next generation sequencing technique where you um, extract your DNA and then basically you sequence everything which is in that DNA sample. And because the chloroplast genome occurs in multiple copies in each cell, there's more of it. So in your results of your genome skimming, you will get a lot of chloroplast DNA and only very limited nuclear DNA. So it's easier to recover the information from the chloroplast genome and get a full um, chloroplast genome read to then do the analysis with. Also historically for plants, phylogenies, most genes that have been used are chloroplast genes. So if you want to compare with the older literature, it's easier to do. What's exciting, however, is how quickly genetic analysis techniques are evolving and becoming more accessible and therefore coming down in price. But nowadays, in the last year or two, (coughs) there have been a number of kits designed that allow you to also sequence nuclear genes but then maybe 300 or 500 selected genes. And that has now also been produced like as a universal kit. So you don't have to design one for each plant family. You can use this this single universal one 
to use on every plant group, making it a lot cheaper. So if we had to redo this project today, we might choose to use one of those universal kits that do nuclear genes as well. I think in this one you had said you sampled 50 of the plants formerly known as Sansevieria. And what are some of the, I know you haven't published the paper yet, but what were some of the surprises that you might be able to share? Were there like less species, more? Were there things that you thought were, you know, in a little subgroup and then there weren't? So the last paper that was published with Sanger sequencing data basically indicated that for everything they sampled, that all of the previous groupings that had been um, published within Sansevieria, like sections and and uh, some informal groups within it, they didn't find any that made sense with the molecular data. We at least found two that do definitely make sense morphologically and based on, on DNA data. And there's one more that probably also kind of aligns that way. Um, so that's that's quite nice, is that some of the morphological characters are at least informative still. Um, there's also a grouping of Asian species, which all come out together. So there's some kind of biogeographical link. And then their sister relationship is to species that occur in the Arabian Peninsula and East Africa. So that kind of links them to the African ones. So that's also quite interesting. And then one of the analysis that is still running is a dating analysis. So we're looking at kind of being able to also say these groups uh, evolved then and, you know, at what time. But that, that one's still running. <laughs> so why does the name Sansevieria still persist even after six years since this paper was published? I mean, I think we all know the answer. I mean, simply because old habits die hard and horticulturists who have been growing Sansevieria for years, they don't want to hear this. They, they don't want to give up the name. And customers know snake plants as Sansevieria. So that's what they search for when they go on Google or when they go into a garden center and they ask for snake plants or Sansevieria. So it's going to pers persist for a long time to come. So I guess when you hear me say Dracaena trifasciata, formerly known as Sansevieria trifasciata, then you will actually know why uh, because I want to keep you guys up to date as possible and when possible and inform you along the way so that you hopefully have the upper edge on all this taxonomy as well. All right guys, let me know if that helped to shed some light on this new reclassification of Sansevieria into Dracaena and actually what you think about it. Just tell me in the comments below. It'll be great to read the discussions there. And help a gal grow her channel by planting your finger on that subscribe button. And if you click the bell, you'll get new videos delivered to your inbox. And if you want to get both a foundational knowledge and a better understanding of houseplant care, maintenance, and more, then check out the month-long Houseplant Masterclass course at houseplantmasterclass.com. Bye, guys.